It was a short overnight trip from Wellington on the North Island to Picton on the South Island. By the time we awoke in the morning, we had already crossed Cook Strait and entered Queen Charlotte Sound. The water here was calm and there was minimal human activity. At the end of Queen Charlotte Sound is the small town of Picton. This quiet town of 5,000 is dependent upon daily ferry boats for transportation of people and goods to the North Island and other locations. While we were docked, a ferry arrived, loaded, and departed. Our destination today is the Marlboro Wine Region, which is 20 miles south. To get there, we cross a hilly terrain and arrive in a broad, flat valley surrounded by distant mountain ranges. This immense 270 square mile valley is almost completely filled with vineyards. We noted that large areas of the hills appear to be barren. This is because lumber has been harvested, leaving the hills covered with seedling trees. These trees take 34 years to mature. Our first stop is the Jackson Winery. The tasting center was in a building having a rustic facade but a modern, classy interior with fine artwork. We were told that their 2015 Pinot Noir had been selected as the best Pinot Noir in the world at the London International Wine Competition. We then tasted and enjoyed their Pinot Noirs, Sauvignon Blancs, Rieslings, and Chardonnays and enjoyed them all. We visited their grotto basement and learned that 85% of the wine produced in this region is Sauvignon Blanc. It is known for its distinctive, light, crisp citrus flavor. On the way to the next winery, we noted that some vines were fully covered with netting to prevent birds from eating the fruit. In other vineyards, roses are planted at the end of every row. Roses are more sensitive to fungus than the grapevines and provide an early warning of problems. The second winery was Cloud Bay, which had an expansive yard where we could sit and enjoy our wine tastings in a shady, relaxing environment. The selection was large and the wines were good. We had our lunch at the Giesen Winery, followed by an almost unbelievable tasting of over 20 different wines some selling for as much as $80 a bottle. Next was Hunter Wines, where we sat around a large table and tasted five wines from the collection. This added to the experience because it promoted conversation among the group regarding the wine characteristics. After completing the tasting, I wandered back to inspect the wine processing equipment and admire the displayed artworks. We stopped at the St. Clair Vineyard, which had the look of a wine bar. We sat at a long table under a porch roof and tasted five wines, which were much like the wines we'd had at the other estates. Unfortunately, by this point in the day, we were all becoming tired. The final stop of the day was the Rock Ferry Winery. This was a small, newer winery that tried to differentiate itself. It produced a Gruner Vettliner wine that we had not encountered on this excursion. They also make a Pinot Blanc in an egg fermenter, which is a large egg-shaped concrete container that is used in place of a barrel for fermentation. Holly and Aki are pondering their options. After a long day and a lot of very good wine, we rode back to Picton and boarded the ship for our next destination, which is Nelson. Another short overnight journey brought us to the town of Nelson on the eastern shore of the Tasman Bay. Nelson is a small city with a population of 50,000. It has many beautiful parks and beaches, but unfortunately all we have time for today is a quick walking tour down Trafalgar Street through the center of town. Trafalgar Street is a brick-paved, tree-lined street with beautiful hanging flower baskets and decorations. Many of the buildings are from the 1800s and have been extremely well maintained. 
At the end of the street is the Nelson Anglican Cathedral. In front is a cast iron street light containing its own water fountain. We climbed elaborate stone steps leading up to the cathedral, noting trees that appear to be over a hundred years old. We toured the church, which being Anglican had a minimal amount of decoration. The stained glass rose window and the sidewall windows were quite beautiful, along with the woodwork for the pulpit and the organ. The only unexplainable decorations were several metal structures that looked like stairways and platforms, but were suspended by cables high above the pews with no apparent function or purpose. Running out of time, we scurried back through town to reboard our ship, taking photos along the way of everything that appeared interesting. That evening, there was a chocolate festival aboard the ship. Everything on display was carved, molded, or formed from chocolate. Most were too exquisite to eat, but one never goes hungry on a cruise ship. Overnight, we cruised north, arriving the next morning at an industrial port servicing the city of New Plymouth. As was the case in our other stops, there was a large inventory of lumber waiting to be exported to China. New Plymouth is a city of 55,000 at the base of Mount Taranaki Volcano. We begin our tour this day with a ride through the city, ending at the Ti Riwa Riwa Bridge. This architecturally stunning bridge is designed to appear as a wave or a whale skeletal structure. It serves as a walking bridge for the coastal walkway. Originally, the government was supposed to build a second auto traffic bridge in this area, but they convinced the local community that if they made this bridge wide enough for emergency vehicles, they could build this walking bridge instead. After admiring the bridge, we rode back across town. It was pointed out that most of the homes we were seeing were wood frame because they can flex and are less damaged by earthquakes. Our next destination is Pukakura Park. At the entrance to this park is a pristine manicured cricket field with stands built into the hillside. Beyond the cricket field is a passageway under a canopy of trees that leads to a tea house next to a tranquil lake. We continued along the path on the left side of the lake, noting a variety of flowers, ferns, and trees until we came to a bridge. The bridge was built in 1884, financed by a donation from one of the park board members who had won the money at a horse race. The winning horse was called the Poet, and the bridge bears the name Poet's Bridge. Continuing back along the far side of the lake, we passed more flowers and a cascading waterfall that was fed by pumping 8,500 gallons per minute of water from the lake to the top of the falls. At the end of the path was the Jubilee Water Fountain which was installed in 1897 to honor the Diamond Jubilee of Queen Victoria. The last area that we visited was the Fred Parker Lawn and the Fernery Display Houses. The flowers and displays here were quite meticulously maintained and displayed. It was a true pleasure to experience this quiet grotto and greenhouse filled with beauty and harmony. On the way back to the ship, we stopped at a lookout near the ocean where we could see the shoreline and three volcanoes. The first was the small conical island and ancient volcano of Moturo. The second was Peratutu Rock, a larger but still ancient volcano. The third was Mount Taranaki Volcano, which was mostly covered by clouds on this day, but on a clear day it looks like this. And with this memory, we depart for our next destination, Auckland.